Okay, well, in this video, Mark and I are going to discuss uh, the simplex method, which you read about in section 7.4. We're not going to go through um, the tableaus and the treatment that you saw in 7.4. Rather, we are going to try to give you a conceptual sense for what is going on in the simplex method. So, just to remind you, the problem is to maximize a function, in this case it was a function of two variables, uh, subject to some constraints. Now the, this is the, carpent, uh, the carpenter's problem, uh, just to remind you. The initial constraints were inequalities, but through the introduction of slack variables, these have been converted into equality constraints. If you're still confused about slack variables, we will try to clarify those in the future, but I will indicate what they do for you geometrically in just a second. So those are our two constraints. And, and John, just to stop you, we have a couple of the constraints too, which it looks like you're writing down right now. Yes. So I'll, uh, I'll shut my mouth. Yes, so we're looking for everything to be non-negative. Okay. We've already seen in the reading a geometrical uh, interpretation. And just to sketch it quickly, there was a feasible region. And I'll just label everything in just a second. Feasible region is in the shaded area. Um, and what I've drawn here are the lines that correspond to each of these constraints right here and here, right? So we have this, for example, which we might often label x1, but in fact, this corresponds to x2 equal to 0. So we know we're looking for solutions in this region because x2 is positive, and we're not looking for solutions down here. Uh, this, which we often call the x2 axis, well, that's really just x1 equal to 0. And we're looking for solutions over in that quadrant, right? Because over here, x1 is negative. Likewise, this is the y1 equal to 0 line. And it may not be obvious from that equation, but since you've already seen this in the reading, y1 is positive if you're below that line and negative on the other side. And this is y2 equal to 0. And likewise, y2 is positive if you're below that line. Okay, So that gives us the feasible region. We know from the theorem that we read about that the optimum is going to be at an intersection point. Okay, So simplex method. And here we think about the simplex method conceptually. So initially, we want to maximize our function 25x1 plus 30x2. I'm going to assume that we already have a feasible point, and here we're going to take our first intersection point, which is 0, 0. Okay? And we know that the value of the function there is 0. And now the question is, can we do better by moving along the perimeter? Okay, we already know there's no point moving on the inside. We can just move along the perimeter. So when we ask that question, can we move along the perimeter and find a large value, there's two options. We can either go this way or that way. Right? Now notice, if we move this way, when we move this way, when we move along this line segment, x2 equals 0. So we could ask the question, should we keep x2 equal to 0? Or if we move up this way, we could ask, should we keep x1 equal to 0 and increase x2? Okay. Well, we clearly have a choice. Um, which way do we move? Well, first of all, 
is the uh, value of the function going to increase? A quick inspection of the function tells you that, yeah, it's going to increase in both directions because increasing x1 or x2 increases that function. So we have a choice to make, and that is we choose the direction of fastest, if you like, fastest increase. Okay, So how do I know what that direction is? Right. Well, if I keep x2 equal to 0, my objective function just is 25x1. So we know, just from calculus, that that has a rate of change of 25 or a slope of 25. So as I increase x1 by one unit, the objective function increases by 25. Likewise, for the other case, if I increase x2 by one unit, that slope in that direction is high is 30, so it increases at, at a higher rate than the other direction. So here we should keep x1 equal to 0, and we should increase x2. So I want to just clarify something you said, John, that I think is important, which is there you could look at this and you could say, okay, I'm going to compare how big the objective function is at this point and how big the objective function is at this point, I'm going to choose the one that's got the bigger value. And you're not saying that. You're actually saying you want to walk in whichever, you could either walk in this direction or you could walk in this direction. You want to walk in the direction that's where you're going uphill the fastest, right? That's steepest. And in this case, walking in this direction where x1 is equal to zero, but x2 is increasing is the, is the sort of faster direction to go uphill. That is right. Although it's no guarantee that by the time you get to the intersection point, you are higher than you would have been by going the other direction. Yep. It's just that you initially start walking uphill faster. In fact, right. you keep going uphill faster, but now the question is how far do you go? So absolutely, it's a local argument about starting right here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we keep x1 equal to zero, we increase x2. How much can we increase x2? This, I think, is where the geometrical picture is quite nice. We keep increasing x2, Right? as much as we can. But, if you like, we don't want to violate a constraint. All right, so for example, if I increase x2, as I hit this intersection point, y1 has been positive the whole time, and y1 just became zero. If I keep increasing x2, y1 becomes negative, which in life is fine, but if I want to satisfy these constraints, I'm going to disallow. So I'm just not going to allow us to move beyond that point. So you just walk in that direction until you hit the first intersection. I walk until I hit the first intersection. Okay. Once you've hit an intersection, then you're, if you go past that, you violate the constraint. Exactly, so in this case, we go until y1 equals 0. And if I'd had a different picture, it might have been y2 equals 0. Who knows? OK, so now we're at this intersection point. And now we need to understand the landscape around us. And when I say the landscape, I sort of mean, what's the coordinates that we're using here? And what directions can we move? Okay. So now that I'm at this point, let me just label this as A, and I'll rewrite this as A. Um, now well, let's say we're at point B. Okay, and you can see that uh, maybe this example in two dimensions is not nearly as useful as it might be in higher dimensions, because if we play this game, we don't seem to have many options. Okay, but I'll pretend that we do. Sitting at this point, we could move in two directions. We could move um, in the, so we could maintain, what did I say last time? We could keep y1 equal to 0, right? Or we could keep x1 equal to 0. Okay, so I'm thinking about x1 and y1 as now being my coordinate axes, if you like. Okay. 
And so keeping one of those equal to zero just means that you're moving by keeping one of those variables, slack variables or decision variables zero, you're forcing yourself to be on the boundary somewhere. Ex exactly. I'm forcing myself to be on the boundary. Now, the reason I say this may seem artificial is, great, I can imagine why I might want to keep y10 because that means I can walk along this line. Keeping x10 means I keep walking along this line, but I've already ruled out going any further and there's no point going back. Okay. But in higher dimensions, and maybe we'll comment that in a minute, there's going to be more choices here. Okay, so now I keep y1 equal to 0, I, or I keep x1 equal to 0. I need to ask the question. Choose, again, the direction of fastest increase. Okay. Now, notice this implies something, because when we initially wrote our objective function, I'll just write it as value, um, we need to express this as a function of x1 and y1, right? Because as I vary x1 and y1, I want to know in which, which one leads to fastest increase. So that's connecting back to the reading. That's why we take our initial expression, which was in terms of x1 and x2, and we use one of the constraints to re-express x2 in terms of x1 and y1 so that we have a new expression in terms of x1 and y1. And I'm not going to do the details here, but that's why you're doing that. So you're really rewriting or making a variable transformation, and we did that quite a bit in linearity 1. We, we're transforming our coordinate system, if you like. Okay. So we do the same thing. We figure out which direction. In this case, it's keep y1 equal to 0 and move. Okay, And you can see that we move in this direction. And generally, a couple of things could happen. As we move, we may start to approach an intersection point where we're about to violate a constraint. In this case, we approach the intersection point where y2 becomes 0. Okay, And again, we don't move past that point because we don't want to violate the constraint. So now we're sitting at point C. Right? So at point C, we have y1 equal to 0, and we have y2 equal to 0. And now if I think about that as my key coordinates, I'm going to move along one of those axes. So I'm either going to keep y1 equal to 0 or y2 equal to 0, but we can see geometrically that there's nowhere left to move. Right? If I move along y2 equal to 0, I'm going to decrease. Mm -hmm. And we would see that by, um, again, expressing the value as a function of y1 and y2. And when we do that, we see that whichever, whatever we do to y1 and y2, in terms of increasing those values, the, fu the function value is going to decrease, and we know we're done. So I guess maybe a question that I think we could ask people to think about at this point, and we're not going to answer in this video, is sort of, okay, we've walked through this sort of qualitative explanation of what's going on in the simplex method which of the steps of the simplex method correspond to each of these decisions? Like at which point do you actually decide that you've got an intersection? At which point do you figure out what the direction is of greatest change? What, how do those steps in that algorithm correspond with this sort of qualitative picture? And if you can understand, if you can look at that algorithm and understand how, those quali how these qualitative steps correspond to the algorithm, then you've really got this under control. And what a great topic for Thursday that would be. Indeed.